Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Superlative Podcast. My guest today is one of my podcast co-hosts, uh, Richard <laughs> Atkinson. Richard, welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's nice to be here. It's, n- it's nice to not have to do anything other than just talk. I don't need to control anything in the background, worry about how difficult the edit's going to be. So I can just sit here and it's somebody else's problem <laughs> for a change, which is fun. Exactly. And and now you know one of the principal delights I have when doing the podcast with you is that I, in that scenario, <laughs> can just be a guest as well and be like, wow, this is great. And long ago, and this is even before I did podcasting, I knew this maxim where the talent in radio was supposed to do nothing but just like <laughs> enter the building, sit down and talk. It, it, there was something about how if you get them involved in the tech part at all, it can um, ruin it. And similar on TV, you know, the talent's not supposed to be like, hey, what's up with that lighting or anything like that. (laughs) So in our context, you know, the sooner we can fully move to just sitting down and recording, um, the better. Do you think that will like materially improve uh, show quality or is it actually kind of nice that we're also like, oh my God, it's not recording. It's not recording (laughs) in the background. There's always something uh, remarkably funny about a, the most senior Swiss watch executive you can find who is struggling with technology, runs a billion-dollar company but can't use Zoom, Does, doesn't know how to swap microphones or, or video. It's always something uniquely humbling about, no, 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 wait, say to like a, no, 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 it's go to the bottom left of your screen, you see that little arrow, click on that, it'll, it'll bring up a wee box and, and then we can speak properly. So I, I think we need to keep the... The uh, the engagement in this AI is a great thing, and all do it for yourself. But I just think there's something great about the the the, the abject humiliation of billion dollar watch executives when faced with social when faced with recording things. And it's true. <laughs> like when we try to get guests, you know, on on this show or on a blog to watch weekly that uh, Richard and I do together with some other co-hosts, um, you know, it's it's funny. Once in a while, there'll be a a company that has set up. But you know, the, the most common mm-hmm. issue is they block all the recording platforms. So they <laughs> scramble true. around. It's like, does your computer work? No. Does your computer work? Wait a minute. D- can we use your VPN? What about your phone? And it's like <laughs> the watch brands itself, even though they want the publicity, we're basically giving them free publicity. Mm. Their mm. IT department still thinks that we're like um, North <laughs> Korean hackers. Yes, yes. The number of times I've had a Oh, can we not use Teams? And no, we can't use Teams. Teams is useless for anything to do with uh, podcasting. You either have to use Zoom, record locally, or use a Riverside or a Zencaster. We cannot use Teams. So just you know, get that out of your... I just your got off of a Teams time. call. I, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Is that why they use it? Because it's quote-unquote secure, even though I, I, no I one can ever connect? Yeah, I think the idea being that you can't actually, you know, accidentally record, send, I don't know. I don't know what the issue is, but it seems to be it seems to be the platform they trust. Unfortunately, it's a platform that's completely useless for doing this. But well, uh, yeah. Let's let's muse on the topic that mm. in the visual luxury watch industry, one of the most successful things today is casual, mostly non-visual, at least there aren't, you know, sexy pictures of watches podcasting and related content. How do, isn't it an interesting irony that this is one of the most popular and fastest growing, we know this, forms of media in a space that is usually stuffy and almost entirely visual? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, uh, an, uh, an audio media for a visual world. <laughs> it's like, we're going we're gonna to talk about this stuff and you really need to see it. And yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense that watch podcasts and podcasting in general for, you know, topics that include physical things. You know, fair enough, a podcast on religion or sport or whatever. A podcast that's actually about stuff actually works and people actually imagine their mind's eye. I mean, it's sometimes not very difficult to imagine what the latest Panerai looks like because they look like all the previous Panerai. But, you know, there, 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 there is this thing about, you know, this is an audio medium and we're talking about things. And, and it's really difficult not to refer to images and pictures and go, wait, you know what we're looking at? And they're like, no, no, we're not looking at it because you're speaking to us through headphones rather than rather than pictures. So it, it is a bit odd that podcasting, especially in the watch space, because there's like another one, you know, 
There'll be another three podcasts, even still about watches along five minutes from now. And good luck to them. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy it while it lasts. You know, you know when I knew long ago that something like this was bound to work? It was when I was a kid. Not that I was thinking about watch podcasting back then, but just this idea <laughs> I bet, of... The thing uh, is, I bet you were. I bet little, little Ariel... A little bit. Little, little bit. Ariel is still, is still thinking about watches and podcasts as, a, as an 11-year-old. If only I could get my voice out there to be heard by millions of people. I was planning it, planning it. But I, I remember that I noticed that people would listen to radio programs about sport, sh- sport games mm-hmm. that were happening right then. And I was... I could not imagine that people were so interested in this topic that they were listen, willing to listen to someone describe what was going on <laughs> as opposed to watching it. When I saw that, I realized, wait a minute, people will listen to people talk about just about anything. Yes, I mean, we're experts in this country because, you know, the, the whole, I don't know if you're, is the, does the phrase back to square one, is that something that translates in America? Sure, I mean, going yeah, back to the so, beginning. I, I, and that, well, that's based on the fact that when they used to broadcast Football matches, and by football we mean, you know, a sport where you actually, your foot comes in contact with the ball, rather than football where all you do is you handle it. I I know, our name's dumb, I get it. And the way they used to do it is they would print in the newspaper, like, uh, a grid, and it'd have squares on it, and it would be labelled one to whatever, and when it went back to square one, that was the ball going back to the goalkeeper. And they would commentate by telling you what square the ball was in. The ball's in square 12 and everyone could look at their bit of paper and imagine where in the football pitch uh, the, the ball was. So yes, we've been trying to interpret how we communicate a visual visual stuff to audio media since basically the year dot. The thing that has I, I could say evolved the most on the mm. media side since I started this career you know, going on 17 years now has been the community element what I mean by that was it wasn't that there was no community element when I started doing a blog to watch in 2007, but it was nascent and weird. And really the success of a blog to watch was that people could read about this and chat with one another in the comments and they didn't know each other. Um, But this community element has just sort of grown and grown and grown and grown. And I just want to know from your perspective, when did you first notice that there was a I, again, I don't actually know, don't know how long you've been into watches, but when did you first yeah. notice that there was a watch enthusiast community? Well, I mean, that was kind of what got me into it uh, via my wife's cousin who worked for Richemont, uh, but was in the process of leaving Richemont, as as most senior people in Richemont seem to do on a regular basis. That should uh, be a book, The Process of Leaving a- Richemont. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was kind of him that got me into it. We actually got snowed in one winter. And so I just ended up chewing the fat and talking about his job. And I was always like watch adjacent. I, I would always stop and look in the window. I had a watch, you know, that kind of thing. It wasn't that I was completely ignorant to brands and things. It, in Scotland, other than Rolex, the big brands were always Tag Heuer and Breitling that you would see in the store, as well as your Casios and, and all the rest of it. And it was really the process of speaking to him and then the process of going, oh, Actually, you see, if you look on social media, there's all these people who are also into this. And it was actually that that drew me into it. And then via the likes of Red Bar, that actually there are other people who are just as, you know, frankly, geek, geeky. Who, you know, it, it's the it's the boys and their toys or the, and the girls and their toys. You know, you grow up, you get a bit of money, and so you decide what you're into. And it might be sneakers, Lego, cars, or in this case, this case, watches. So it was actually seeing that there was a community of interesting people who were interested in something I was interested in that drew me into the first place. Otherwise, I would still probably just be looking in the windows of jewelers and all the rest of it. It was the people that drew me into the whole thing rather than the watch. I don't have a watch collection. I've got a Panerai and like a Moon Swatch and an Apple Watch and you know a couple of other bits and pieces. But uh, it, you know, it's the people and the community that drew me in and, and have kind of kept me in. Over the and, there, and that story is is obviously with different details, but hmm. the story of community bringing people into the hobby is common these days. And Absolutely. the watch industry needs to take stock at some point of the fact that an enormous amount of active consumers uh, would have never been 
watch buyers or repeated watch buyers if it wasn't a social element to it, a community <clears throat> element to it, which which comes with complexities and nuances <clears throat> and flavors, of course. Um, but what I'm thinking actually is how distinct that is from my own experience getting to watches. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I remember some of the first times going to what you'll call them watch events <clears throat> and being shocked and being like, this is what other watch collectors are like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, because uh, it's like, do you I know really I mean? want to be in this community? I was like, I, I might have changed my mind. The community actually just leave them alone. <laughs> um, I mean, look, it's like any community out there. You know, you're going to have this big thing in common, but you're mm. going to also have certain things you don't have in common. For a while, I really thought that like a love of watches can really bring people together. Meaning like you could disagree on everything else, but if you like watches, oh. you'll be friends. And then I've mod- I modified that to be like 85% true. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so it's still much better than your average person out there in terms of you know learning you have something in common that'll make you friendly. Um, but you can still be mortal enemies with someone and, and mm. agree that watches are cool. Yeah, it is a bit like <laughs> being a fan of a football team it kind of brings folk together from backgrounds that just would not be speaking to each other, classes, uh, areas, regions, working life, religion, political beliefs. I mean, sometimes it crosses over and sometimes you see, I, I don't know, it's one of these things where folk accidentally, because everybody has a watch account and a personal account. It's one of those rare hobbies where I think people developed a social media presence that was like a personality, you know, like a, some sort of schizophrenic, here's my watch personality. <laughs> and they would never post any of their watch content on their original social media that identified that they were a bank manager from Boston or whatever. Uh, but sometimes the crossover, you know, sometimes they forget to post, they post on the wrong bit and you'll see someone post their political beliefs in their watch account and you go, yeah, I really didn't think that person was like that. And, you know, I, I'm re-evaluating, <laughs> re-evaluating my thoughts. But you know what? He's actually got quite a cool watch collection, so we'll let him away with it. Uh, you know, so, yeah. I've, been, I've been lucky because when I go to these disparate parts of the world where I should have nothing in common with the locals because I'm not from mm-hmm. there, I've actually been able to to stick to watches. I've been able to get, a, get away with speaking about almost nothing else. Um <laughs> In Asia, I actually learned the hard way, like, don't talk about politics. Like, sometimes mm-hmm. I would bring it up as a joke. Just, you know, like, just as a joke. And, like, especially, like, because in China, there is an immediate sense of a discomfort you can see. And I'm like, okay, I, that was a bad idea. Because you Americans are so great at your subtle joking and your joshing around. Oh, no, we're very about, direct. That's the thing. We're so direct. <laughs> so tell me about your freedoms. <laughs> we got uh, a lot of them and we love sharing them with everyone. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Please, you must take this freedom. We, you're obliged to. Have some freedoms, courtesy of the US of A. <laughs> um, but look, I mean, it's, it's funny because there's been a lot of situations where I have been the only American, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that's been fine. I, you know, I've never, I've never felt uncomfortable. Like, oh, I need a, I need, I need, I need a fellow American around here, or else I'm something bad's going to happen. But it has been a topic that can really bring people together who, just by virtue of distance, have really nothing else in common. You know, as long as they can share, even if they don't speak the same language, you can just sit there and nod you know, approvingly of the same design or brand or something like that. And I learned that a long time ago. And then creating the conversation around it, right? And this is what's interesting to me and where it gets controversial is the first podcasts around watches were really just about the product, right? Mm. But then there became so many of those conversations, sort of like with the blog to watch, like no one's really ever done watch reviews better than us. So Mm. what they've had to do is write other articles about watches and other topics, which which they have. Some of them we don't find interesting at all, like what celebrities are wearing or, you know, something that's about (laughs) what vintage watch prices are going for. But (laughs) what we find is that they they segment the conversation. And so you – and that's a very mature collecting hobby, right? Like if it's just just talking about the product and reviews, that's sort of one layer. But now you're getting into sort of culture and you identify – as a watch lover, like, you know, no one's like identify, like, I identify as a car driver, like people have a car, but mm-hmm. people like identify as belonging to this hobby and that 
is something which means that they involve themselves in reading about it, even when they're not interested in buying the product. Mm. I think it's a very interesting thing for brands to wrap their, their mind around, <clears throat> is that people are reading about new watch releases. People are listening to a podcast like this, or a blog to watch weekly, or one of the other fine programs out there. <laughs> um, not Don't because exist. they're like, I gotta buy another watch right now, I need to hear about it. They just generally wanna hear what other folks like them have to say about things or what it's like to sort of be part of those conversations. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's basic to say it's social, um, but it, it is very much a, a key part of many people's lifestyle, right? Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's changing. Like how? I, well, and I think on the one hand, it's quite a mature uh, market the podcasting the watch side and there's lots of elements of it that are mature and advanced and don't have many places to go and then there's the other side of it whereby actually we still have no idea what's going on the brands still have no idea what to do with social media and podcasts and youtube and all the rest of it and it's a really strange mix of yeah bits everybody understands and bits that folk really are still scrabbling around in the dark. It's what you see in, in, in watch media and in trends. You know, the trend for the past five years has been, from a watch media side, has been, let's all sell stuff. And then we're seeing, you know, I, I, we've got to pro, a blog to watch is probably, well, we're certainly the largest media group that doesn't sell watches. And we're probably, you've, we're probably like the last because any media group of any size is selling watches at the moment. But that's all starting to un, pardon the pun, to unwind. Because it turns out that their journalists aren't actually that good at selling stuff. That's not what we got into it for. And people are learning that. And so now what you're seeing is it's all about collaborations. And this is the latest thing. Every watch brand of any sort of smaller size, so not the, necessarily the Rolex and the Tags, although the Tag and the Hoopos and that are doing all their collaboration, but it's what we would have viewed as being micro brands. Everything's now about a collaboration, a collaboration with a media group, you know, so everybody gets some something free. The media group gets to earn some extra cash through selling watches in inverted commas, and the, the, the brand gets free marketing. They don't need to pay for what they should be paying for. But, that now is starting, and in speaking to some people who've been involved in collaborations, is now starting to unwind. I think a lot of people are now seeing it for what it is, which is an easy way to get rid of product that may or may not be better than what the brand could have done by itself. And what you're now starting to see, uh, kind of in, in the distant foothills, is the media and some of the, you know, the personalities, because now we've built up media such that we now have personalities within the media. It's not a blog to watch. It's Ariel Adams and a blog to watch. It's such and such and such and such. And and you're now seeing these people going, well, actually, I'll just cut out the middleman. I'll just create my own watch brand. And so that's, that's what's now starting to happen is ADs, media outlets. And I say, oh, what do I need? They're suddenly realized that they're the ones that, manage to sell the watches because a watch company can't sell watches unless people find out about them. They'll, they'll sell to a very limited, a very small brand will only be able to sell watches if somebody knows about the watch. And so the people that are involved in making sure that everybody knows about the watch are suddenly realising they have all the power and they can miss out the middleman by phoning the same Chinese or Asian manufacturer that the watch brand they were doing a collaboration with is using. So I think what you're beginning to see now is the rise of the media stroke authorised dealer driven new watch brand. Uh, and I think that's a reflection of just how immature, because everyone's still trying the the kind of tricks, you know, the things you would try if you discovered, you know, if you suddenly discovered that gold was a valuable thing, you'd start trying to put it in everything and then you'd, you'd go off on this wee, wee journey using it for this and then using it for that. And where we are in the watch world now is, I think we're starting to see the falling off of the collaboration or the the fed upness from the watch geek world of the collaboration. I think it's still got ages to run. 
in the wider world. But uh, I think you're now starting to see in the foothills that well, I've just created my own brand and it's called X, Y, and Z. So I think we're going to see a spate of YouTubers, podcasters, authorised dealers, all with their all, all with their nice new new shiny watch brand. And that'll be something that last five years and then we'll on to the next thing. We'll, we'll, after that, we'll all suddenly decide that what we should do is just do what we're good at, which is watch manufacturers should make watches, journalists should report on watches, authorised dealers should sell watches, and without wishing to be critical, everyone should just stick to the knitting because it's it's kind of vanity just to be wandering around in these other other spheres. Yeah, thanks for you know summing up in a lot of detail many of the issues right now that are you know going on in the industry. It's a sort of chaotic uh, evolutionary time right now. There's mm-hmm. a lot of flux, and and I sort of see it as being a bunch of plates in the air. We're not really sure how it's going to sort of <clears throat> fall on the ground. You know, for those that are more interested in these topics, I've written a lot of essays over the last several months, uh, years actually, about these topics and where I think things are going to go. So uh, you're absolutely right that these are manifesting themselves um, all, all over the place. And, and we know that this is an industry of, of feeding frenzies. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is if there seems to be uh, food, <laughs> they're not going to think, uh, is it even worth going to the party? Is there going to be food left? There's like food, food, everyone's eating. I'm going to go in there and try to eat all I can. And and then once all the fish are gone, all you just have is a bunch of hungry sharks. They're like, wait a minute, I was told there was food here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this industry is attractive to a lot of people who look at it as a business model. Like, here's a way to make a buck. And, and there's business models everywhere. But when it comes to investment, you can't just start up your own car maker with, you know, a few hundred grand. But mm-hmm. with, like, you know, a few tens of thousand dollars, you can start up a watch brand and get some type of original-ish watch made um, and so it appeals to a classification of, of modern entrepreneur who feels like they can use tools available in their living room on their computer and some money uh, to launch a company. And that is technically true. Uh, but as we know, to truly succeed, it takes more than just applying a business model and and smiling a lot and being a good salesperson. You need to have some real soul, so to say, behind the product, and it has to really resonate with people. Um, but this sort of massive experimentation is healthy, I think, and it makes things interesting for us. But it also has led to something which I think you've also touched on, which is <clears> – <throat> The massive amount of competition in all sides of the watch industry, whether it's watch retailers, watch brands, watch models, or watch media, the competition is extremely fierce where it's ironic because only certain segments there do anybody make any money or real money, yet no matter what it is, people want to be a part of it. And I think that that is probably a function in some ways of the sheer desirability of the product. Like, yeah. we can't always explain it rationally, but watch collecting, watches, uh, luxury on the wrist is today, for whatever reason, unbelievably desirable. Yeah, I mean, you don't get political journalists one very often. I'm sure there's one or two examples. But those that have trained as a journalist or podcast about politics, don't suddenly decide they want to be a politician. But people who talk and YouTube about watches do feel a draw into the the actual watch side of things. And it's because it is so appealing. I mean, you go to these big shows and it's full of the world's most beautiful people and the world's richest people. You know, there are temptations to be avoided in terms of looking at it and going, oh, it'd be so much better to be on that side of the fence. And I think one of the disciplines about doing what we do, and I don't do this full time by any stretch of the imagination, you do, is avoiding the temptation to just look at it and go, I I would really like to be on that side of the equation. And not on that side of the equation by leaving what I'm doing on this side, but by doing both. And I don't think you can long-term have a foot in both camps. And I think we are 
I think it's the it's probably a luxury thing. I don't know if people that report on fashion or jewelry or sports cars <clears throat> find themselves being dragged into the other side of the industry. I don't my impression is that it's not the same temptation. Like you don't maybe it's because it's so easy to report on watches because it's it's dead easy to set up and start speaking. I mean, I did it from a, a you know a standing start uh, at Scottish Watches, and uh, it's so easy to do it from nothing. Whereas maybe actually you need to be a bit more connected to you know break into the world of fashion reporting. Or I mean, possibly the only one only industry that might be similar might be something like food, like people who. Who uh, you know talk about food and drink and stuff like that? Maybe that's one of the easier ones. Actually, I'm now I've spent all my time critiquing this stuff. Now I'm going to set up the restaurant that would be the one I would want to go to, uh, and it's that. Same so, do you want pressure. to start a watch brand? Because I feel like that's where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Newsflash: As for those who listen to Bulk to Watch Weekly, media alert: <laughs> We are starting our own watch brand. Do I want to start? No, I don't think I do. I, I don't, I think... But you kind of said, like, it's the natural progression. Not for all, oh, but I, I, you seem I very convinced of it. Well, I think it's the natural temptation is maybe a better phrase. I, I, I would be surprised, Ariel, if you have not, uh, in your uh, in your long, dark tea times of the soul, sat there going, you know what? I am so fed up with these guys. I could do this so much better. And, and being tempted to go, right, I'm phoning up three people. They're going to give me 100 grand each. And we're going for it. We're producing, resurrecting some old Swiss brand name. I'd be Would you believe if that, it if I said no? Well, have you never been approached? Has no one ever said, or is it just that you're so well known that you would say no that nobody ever asks? Somebody comes along and goes, Ariel, I, you, you and me, we could, we could take on the world. We could, we could be the next Rolex or you know whatever. I, so, I would rather be given an opportunity to like fix a broken brand mm. than start my own because uh, I would yes. see it as a challenge. I would agree. I think that would be my more my more natural uh, entrepreneurial bit would be to fix something rather than I start something I feel uncomfortable brand new. when I see... This sounds weird because I've designed watches, but I feel mm. uncomfortable when I see someone wearing my watch not because I don't want them to wear it. I'm so happy and I like it for a thing, but I, it's like, I feel like it's a reflection of me and I feel like I'm too exposed. I think that I'm too discreet as a person to want my personality to be so out there like that. I, I, when I see people wearing the watches I, I make, I, I'm, a, I'm happy that they find it attractive and, I, and it, it looks good on them. So I'm ha- like, it validates like, oh, wow, that is a good looking watch. But mm-hmm. I don't know that I could just have a bunch of designs or a whole brand that I said is a reflection of me. Um, it's, it's a strange thing emotionally. Uh, and, and it takes the right type of person to not only want to assert your, your taste, but also assert yourself and be like, you are wearing me on your wrist. And, you, and I've seen mm-hmm. this in the world of, of fashion. Or this is fashion designers. And really, it's like they're convincing people, like, wear their ideas on, on their body. And that requires a certain level of confidence. I'm a critic, right? Like, I, mm. I like being snarky about bad stuff. <laughs> I, yeah. I'd be too snarky about my own stuff. Um, for me, it's more of a challenge than the ego thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think probably because I quite enjoy being snarky. <laughs> I think that's what, that, that's what stops me going to the other side. Because actually, it's quite nice just to go yaboo hiss at something or that's great. Although it's actually more fun sometimes just to go yaboo hiss at the idiocy of of uh, of luxury goods full stop uh, and some of the, the stories. It's, an, it's like it. it's, when, you see, when we see a bad luxury watch, it's mm-hmm. the most spectacular trip and fall you've ever seen, <laughs> right? Because there's so much pomp and circumstance and hope behind it. And and you'd think that it takes a lot to convince someone to spend, you know, top dollar or a lot of money on a luxury watch. And so when they when they miss it, it's it's like a, it's like a bad blockbuster movie. Like, oh, it had all the it could have been great, but they just ruined it. And, and <laughs> it's like a trip and fall. So it's not as, you know, 
petty as seeing somebody hurt themselves, but it is sort of like intellectually funny to see what was trying to be really impressive and is ultimately, <laughs> wow, yes. there, very there are, funny. There are a few genuine casualties in the watch world. Like, it's not life and death. These people in Switzerland or elsewhere will, will still go home to their big mansions and their huge cars and their servant quarters or whatever. So there's very little to feel sorry for in the luxury industry when they drop the ball. It, it is just fundamentally funny because what you see more often than not is such groupthink of everybody, like the the the, the you know the mutual part of the back. Of course, this is a great idea. Of course, this is a great idea, and no one's prepared to not not speak truth to power because that makes it sound like it's actually important. But actually, jump in and say, you know what? Spider-Man on your AP, eh, maybe, maybe just, maybe just leave that one. Maybe just, maybe just don't worry about it. Don't bother. just make your money elsewhere. Just sell some more Royal Oaks. Don't worry about Spider-Man. Uh, yeah, so it, it's it's a bit weird. But tell me, Ariel. So if if you could go in, and it doesn't seem to be a brand that's broken, but Carte Blanche, the uh, the the hedge fund comes on and says, Ariel, we think we think you're the guy. Go go and go and find us a brand. To, to buy it, you can run it, do whatever you like with it. Who who you who you whose door are you knock on? And say yeah, I'd like to I'd like to have that one. Old, new, existing, already successful. What's what's the dream job out with of journalism in the watch world? I mean, look, it's a it's a fair question, and I think one of the characteristics the brand would have to have is the ability to do entirely new stuff. Like mm-hmm. having to take the same design and be true to the DNA and blah 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 blah. Like <laughs> that does not interest me at all. Like I I don't I'm not here to like refine an icon. Um, I want to use it as a platform to make something fundamentally different. Being able to be creative, trying new stuff, weird stuff, mm-hmm. um, but also understanding in general like best practices. Like I've seen mm-hmm. so many failures and things like that. I tend to know the outcome of a lot of decisions, or at least I understand the risk or if it's going to be able to accomplish some goal. Um, I also think that it would be great to have something where the brand can engage in some storytelling, right? So like just making products Mm -hmm. without being able to do uh, reasons behind why the product exists and and make some content around that, I think would be very boring. Mm -hmm. Um, Because here's the thing for me, where I usually see, man, if I could do it, it isn't about the watch or the brand, but it's about how they launch it or how they market it or how they advertise it. Like we just see so many missed opportunities of creating interesting, relevant messages. And I used to like write little commercials in my brain, whether they're like a video or or just like a, an ad, you know, imagine like it's an old, you know, magazine ad. Um, but I see them fumble in that area all the time. So being able to, you know, put <laughs> put myself in the position where I'm actually now making the advertising and seeing if it works well. I've always been curious. I've had all these ideas about marketing and storytelling I think would work. If I actually did it, would it be successful? Would it pan out the way I thought? Or would I just be, humble myself and be like, oh my God, what the hell was I thinking? I, <laughs> so I don't know. Turns out this is more difficult than we all thought. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll slow up going, I'm never going to criticize I mean, look, watch exactly we, again because it turns out it's quite difficult. <laughs> we look at some of those old watch ads and we recognize mm. hard work went into them. And But we all seem to agree that they're better than today. And the thing is this, they were speaking to one audience and they didn't care if that discussion pissed off a different audience. Mm. And that's really just the, 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 common, the, the common theme is that somebody was going to be insulted as a result of seeing it, and they were just okay with that. There was no uh, feedback loop. It wasn't like there was comments yeah, or something yeah. like that, so it was hard for them to know. But they were just like, I'm speaking to this one demographic. This other demographic over here is going to hate it, but that doesn't matter because I'm, I'm trying to sell to this primary de- demographic over uh-huh. here. So – the the fact that people are afraid of the negative commentary, I believe, is as a red herring. I get that it emotionally feels bad, like mm-hmm. people hate it, but I think that a lot of marketers and managers need to have the discipline to say, uh, "I don't care," or mm-hmm. "We're I'm here to I'm here to uh, correct a wrong." Right? If, if somebody says something online which is just factually incorrect. I'll say, ma'am, sir, you are not you are not correct. Those are not the facts. That's what you should do. But otherwise, I, I think that you should ignore it. So I see 
a weakness today, a fear, a failure, a fear of of having to justify decisions and pretty much all managers, even even solo entrepreneurs, they're mm. also afraid. But like of like the 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 negative feedback online, and I and I love your opinion. Um, is it that deleterious? Is having some negative comments about you going to ruin you? I don't know. I mean, we play hit miss maybe on a blog to watch weekly, and my kind of dream of what that turns into is that watch brands eventually go, we'd really like you to play Hit Miss Maybe on our watch, knowing that a number of us are going to say that it's a miss because they realise that actually somebody having an opinion about your watch is better than somebody going, oh, it's just another watch. That actually they would rather have somebody go, that's a hit, and five other people go, that's a miss, because actually the value in that one hit appealing to you know one sixth of the people if you if it's some sort of representative sample is actually more valuable to them than everybody going, oh well it's a bit of a maybe. It's a it's a nothing burger. And you know, well well maybe we don't necessarily want to see the IWC adverts reinvented circa 1980, 1990 for the 2020s. I think the fear of and this isn't just applied to watch brands, but the fear of <sighs> I'm not even sure I would call it cancel culture because I'm not sure that that's what it is now. I think it's moved on from the kind of group piling on to issues and people who probably deserve to be piled on to just it almost being random as to who the internet chooses to care about or not care about or wish to, you know, expose or criticize on any given day. And I think the fear of the brands is that it could, you know, it could just be their turn today that, you know, somebody drops the ball, accidentally says something or puts something in a press release. Somebody knows it. And, and that person happens to have 10,000 followers and is followed by somebody who has a million followers and, and it, just gets out of control. So I think there is a lot of fear. And I think a lot of that comes from the corporate structure of a lot of watch brands. There isn't one guy or girl at the top who's like, I don't care. This is what we're doing. For all that we have a go at AP from time to time, the one thing you did know is that uh, Benny Mayas would like say his thing and he'd stick to it because it's, even though the way the AP is owned, he was like, no, it's, it's, I'm running this company. We're doing it my way. If you don't like my way, then that's fine. If you don't like Spider-Man and Black Panther watches, then great. But that's what we're doing. Same at Robex. They're, they're almost bulletproof. But most of the other brands are corporate culture, shareholders, investment funds, hedge funds, insurance companies. And actually, it's a generally a good day in these firms if we've sold some stuff and upset nobody. And that doesn't really lend itself to the creating the new greatest thing or the new whatever in whatever industry if you're living fundamentally in fear that, you know, this might not work or I might get criticised for this or I might get cancelled for some for some way, shape or form. So I think there's a lot of fear out there. And you kind of, the smell, as I say, the smell of fear, you can kind of see it in and around <coughs> some of these big trade shows when everyone's kind of nervous about what's going on. So, okay, I'm going to give you a scenario and you tell me if this is like totally implausible. Mm. We're going back to me running a watch brand, right? And so mm. I, I know it's, I know yes. it's day one, but at some point I'm going to have a meeting, like an all hands meeting, okay? And be like, mm -hmm. okay, everyone, I as the leader now am completely responsible for the reputation of the company. Nobody here, mm. unless you screw up, ultimately mm -hmm. takes responsibility for the reputation of the company. Meaning if we release a product or we mm -hmm. say something and it ends up turning out bad, it's on me. I have to deal deal with it. None of you uh, have have to worry about it at all. I'll say uh, we're going to we're going to look at the comments, but we're not going to be afraid of them. Mm -hmm. We're going to make note of things that we can do better. And we're going to respond to people who have the facts wrong, but we're not going to care if people don't like us uh, mm -hmm. at all. What we are going to care about is some other people somewhere do like us. And what yeah. we're going to do is make sure that the volume of the fans 
is going to be louder than the volume of, I don't know, the the detractors, the haters, as the kids call them. Uh, I'm going to go with detractors. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that, that their volume, the detractors, is going to be pushed down uh, by the fact that we are satisfying the fans um, and that we will communicate where it will say something to some groups and another group won't like it. And that's what we're going to do because that's how you have a communication and a mm. relationship with the community. If I said all that, is that nuts? Would I just be killed and pilloried right there? Or is that is there some wisdom to that? I think there is some wisdom to that. I think it really depends on what you do next. So it's... I start writing else- up some campaigns. It's, it's, it's all very well saying that you've then got to produce it, it's like you've then got to produce something that actually is slightly divisive it, it's fine saying that but if you then just produce a steel sports watch with a colour on it then it's like yeah you, you said it was all great to go and really push the boundaries but you just produce something that looks like everything no, else no but you know what I'm going to do I'm going to make I don't want to call them boring watches I'm, I would do relatively simple watches but I would the the way I would talk about it, the media around them would mm-hmm. be very ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, you remember uh, how Gucci used to advertise a while ago? Just like, what, like you're like, what am I even looking at? It's crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff. Yeah, I can imagine you a big billboard on, on, in Times Square with some, oh, yeah. you know, a weirdo message. It would be you and David. The problem is that it would be referring to some Japanese manga, you know, comic strip that nobody other than about three people ever watched when they were teenagers. I would Made test it. Far I'd be like, we're going to do it. <laughs> you know, I think, my- that's, I think that's, what, I think, and I think that's what you see is successful. I think the rise of micro brands into becoming brands that maybe do stand a generational chance of passing on from current ownership to a new ownership when the current ownership passes away or retires has been seen because they have decided to plow a furrow that's their thing, whether it's style-related or message-related. You know, a good example that springs to mind is fears. It's all built around the personality of Nicholas and of this kind of, you know, kind of very... uh, I'm not sure the best way to describe it is, but high English kind of, uh, not worthy is the wrong word, but kind of, but it's not, po- I wouldn't use the word posh, but it's it's that kind of high society is probably a better thing in that here's a thing that, like we were talking about earlier, that really is about a community of people that love this thing. And they are quite happy in that lane and they're quite happy to stay in that lane as there are with other smaller brands and and it's in the building of that thing whereby we don't need to speak to everybody you know tag hoyer feels like it needs to speak to everybody which is why it's got like a gazillion skus and different varieties of what rolex on the other hand even though it does speak to everybody doesn't actually feel it needs to speak to everybody which is why it produces like 10 different varieties of watch. I mean, which is more than that, but that anybody cares about because it just puts its message out. It's just, and its message is, we're Rolex. And, and that's just it. We're Rolex. They don't dress up with anything. They're quite happy for that to be offensive to some people because some people do take offense at the whole concept of Rolex. Uh, and I think it's in the sticking, again, it kind of goes back to this sticking to your lane Know what you're good at and stick to that. Don't be tempted if you're a drummer to try and become the lead guitarist, even though the lead guitarist might seem like a fun fun job to do. You're a good drummer, so stay doing that. Uh, I'm not sure that even vaguely answers the question or takes it any further. But uh, yeah, I just look forward to the day when somebody calls your bluff on it here at Ariel and says, right, Ariel, we want you to come up with the advertising campaign. And just going to sit back and... Watches the you, you know they're never gonna, in times. Do you want to know why they're never going to put me in charge? Mm-hmm. It's because I'm American. <clears throat> That's I mean I, I hate mm-hmm. to say it. it. It really boils down to that that I'm not a native French speaker or that I haven't yeah. picked it up with fluency mm-hmm. more or less prevents me from ever being mm-hmm. given a trusted position of power and authority mm-hmm. in any of the traditional uh, watch organizations. 
Yes. I have you ever regretted not sticking in at French at school? Oh yeah, because I don't use Spanish at all, unfortunately. Uh-huh. <laughs> like yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah. Like <laughs> I mean that's 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 a lie. I mean, I'm around Spanish speakers a lot. It's great mm-hmm. to understand bits and pieces of it. Mm-hmm. But I it's funny because I used to think that I was like I'm imagining the like the 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 ninth grader version of myself when you had to make this choice because we mm-hmm. all we had at my school is not very fancy was Eng- was was uh, uh, French and Spanish that was it uh, right. a lot of other schools had a bunch of we had two and I you know flip I was like well I live in Los Angeles and there's a bunch of you know Spanish speakers like clear this is a clear choice uh, <laughs> when am yeah, I yeah. ever gonna need French in my life <laughs> lo uh. and behold you know so yes there was a little bit of like. Why did I not have prescience? You mm-hmm. know, um, mm-hmm. because that was a funny, you know, missed opportunity there. Because then I would have had a little bit of, you know, what the conjugation. Because I'm never going to pick up the conjugation as an adult. Mm-hmm. I'm always going to sound like a toddler speaking French. <laughs> I think if uh, when people, which is, doesn't happen very rarely, I've not really a, f- a font of advice to folk. But whenever somebody does speak to me and says, well, "What should I do to get into watch it?" I would always say, "Well, have to speak, speak French." French. Speak French. <laughs> Simple. Speak French, you're halfway there. Speak French, turn up in Geneva, show an interest in watches, you're halfway there. So yeah, stick in at those French, uh, th- those French lessons, kids, uh, if, you, if you want to have a future uh, in this. Because, and it's, I, I mean, without a word of lie, it is so true. Even like the UK-based authorised dealers, the staff members, the ones that get further are because you know they'll fly them over to Switzerland. See if you've got a smattering of French, helps helps no end in being able to to well, you, advance. You, know what's you get just, noticed. You get noticed. What's just starting now, and it's been going on a little bit here and there for a few years, but I feel like it's accelerating is a little bit. Is people who are watch enthusiasts are getting hired to work at brands, not necessarily lead them. And I'm not talking about the entrepreneurs that start their own, but like little running social media or Mm. some marketing role or maybe in a sales thing. But more and more people who were members of the community uh, and were enthusiasts are now being hired in. Whereas just a few years ago, as unremarkable as this sounds, this almost never happened, mm. and watch brands would put out, you know, generalized hiring postings, and it would be from completely unrelated industries and things like that. And you'd wonder, be like, "There's all these nerds out there that would love this job. Mm. Why, why the, the the lady or the gentleman that has literally <laughs> no uh, no expressed interest in this hobby whatsoever?" So, um, I, I think maybe there's hope. Is the point? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Certainly, I, the number of people I can think of who four or five years ago were watch nerds working and doing whatever they were doing, who are now actually working for watch brands, some of them very large watch brands, and have been taken in at least in part because of their own social media reach, their own knowledge of other people within the industry. Because it's weird, and it's just a time thing. You know, making watches is very time-consuming. And actually, a lot of watch brands don't really know what's going on in the rest of the watch world. I was sitting with some people a couple of weeks ago, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm te- you should know this stuff already. You sh- I would have thought you would know what was going on at these other three brands that are actually competitors of yours. or They know surprisingly you know, little, scale. don't they? Yeah. Surprisingly I, little. And I can understand why, because it's a lot of hard work being... Uh, an owner, driver of your own watch brand. I mean, I know what it's like now in the podcast world. I used to listen to hundreds, well, hundreds, as many watch podcasts as I get my hands on. Millions! I basically, which is about millions, actually, probably is 10 to the power of three and growing. Uh, I I listen to very little because this isn't time. And so even, even in my own world is much more narrow than it probably should be uh, doing doing what we do because there's just so much out there and filtering it through to get to the good stuff is so much more difficult because as in podcasting, as in microbrand watches, there'll be another five of all next week uh, and you just can't keep track of it all. I think what makes it difficult for a lot of the employees in this space is that the luxury industry is a lot 
or related to strength and mm-hmm. to admit you don't know something or to even say you don't know or to ask um, can create the perception of weakness in a great luxury house. And so I think that the fact that these people, obviously they're, they're so busy in their own, their own little world, also that they have a prejudice about communicating a, a level of ignorance makes it particularly hard because all these companies need to appear as though they're doing great and they know everything and they have a solid vision, um, yet they're not the types of companies that are even spending that much time looking outside such that people have to be personally interested. And so most of these brands, in order for them to even know some of what you know you and I know, is mm-hmm. they have to decide to spend their extra time listening to the podcast, reading a blog to watch, spending time on Instagram, watching stuff on YouTube, whatever it is, um, they have to do that in their free time. And that's what we found, right? We found that the people we connect with best at the brands are spending a lot of time reading the watch media, sometimes participating, Mm -hmm. but it's not a part of their job. It has nothing to do with their job and they're not even given time at their job to do it. Maybe that's what we should be saying. We're saying that our one advice in the Swiss watch world is they should be listening to our podcast that we produce that we give them the force the them required force listening them. it should be a required part <laughs> is there not some sort of exam these people all need to sit that we can Ooh, kind of get on the, a standardized get on the exam get on the syllabus I belong to watch weekly and superlative on the syllabus of it's so quiet the, the watch in the world. watchmakers room just have podcasts mm. going on in the background all the time I mean that is actually on that is actually probably one of our biggest listenerships when we get feedback is we're not listened to that much by the management because they're all busy running around with their hair on fire. But see the watchmakers, yeah, see the watchmakers who, as you say, are just sitting at a bench all day and can have themselves plugged in. They're the ones that listen to podcasts. You've just got to be very careful that you don't make them laugh too much because, you know, that, <laughs> that hair springs a delicate thing. You know, that, that. <laughs> you know, what my, was, one of my favorite emotions is, is when a watchmaker at mm-hmm. a company um, sees for the first time a piece of marketing or a design that they know will fail and they have to make it or like stick with it. But there's like this little kind of like sad shake of their head where they kind of look down they're like, oh God. <laughs> because they get how the community is going to respond or if it's even a good fit for the brand. So the managers are all running around like they just discovered sliced bread and the watchmaker is like, oh. <laughs> That's right. This is a zirconium thing. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, so and and you're right. The the CEO literally, I've never seen them just sit down next to like uh, uh, one of the watchmakers and be like, "So, what do people think about our products?" <laughs> yes, how easy is this? How, how well engineered is this for us to be able to fix it thirteen times when it reappears? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah. So so it should be allow the watchmakers to listen mm-hmm. and then force the managers to have mm-hmm. lunch. I don't know, once a month with the watchmakers? Is that too much to ask? Yeah, we we will tell you in advance what the vaporware is that your that your your brand is undertaking that will never see the light of day. Just tell us. We'll 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 put down there, give you give you judgment on it. But yeah, so it's uh it's an extraordinary industry, really. I want to talk about podcasting Mm -hmm. a little bit. And the question is this: where does podcasting as an industry need to go in order for our work? to have greater impact on the watch industry. Because po- podcasting is very much mm-hmm. the Wild West. You're sort of mm-hmm. making up the rules. A lot of it is word of mouth. And I, and I understand that a stronger podcast industry, whether that's economics or technology or whatnot, would allow our medium to better serve the interests of the watch industry. What are some changes that you think need to happen to, to, to give us additional um, uh, you know, amplification? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, if you believe what everybody tells you, then the future of podcasts is video, a bit like the future of the telephone was television. Uh, and every man and their dog, including us, is going, well, we've got to get some moving pictures to go with these words that we speak. Uh, so it's, it is a really strange uh, industry podcasting because it, it is maybe, let's say, let's say it's a tenth, of the effort of making a video of equal length. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate, but it might, it might be there or thereabouts. But if a successful video on YouTube will easily do more than 10 times the volume of a successful podcast, 
But podcasting is this weird thing because unlike video, it travels with you. So what probably is happening is you're starting to see the industry understand that it's not simply about the numbers and that actually engagement is different, that there is a value to engagement and podcasting is a much more engaging media than video will ever be. That's why radio never dies. Radio is always there, always constant. Nobody's ever managed to get rid of it because actually it's a thing you carry around with you while you're doing other things. And that's something that television can really never achieve. And what's been Wild West about it is that in the in, in the you know halls of marketing within brands and dealers, etc., is they just look at the metric. And the metric says that Nico's video gets a million views. Great. And the metric says that our podcast get 20,000 listens. Well, great. But his million views are not a scale up from our 20,000 listeners or whatever. It's not the same thing. It's not just about comparing one number with another and say, well, that number's more, therefore that is better. It's actually two very distinct types of medium. And I guess what we're doing now and what lots of podcasts are doing going to video is... Uh, not sticking to the knitting and saying, well, we can, we can get a little bit of that video number. So you see podcasts going on and getting many more thousand YouTube hits than they do listen to an audio. But the quality is now different. It's a different thing. Uh, and so I guess that is what is going to happen, I think, in the next 18 months, is it's going to wash out as to what actually is the value of being in somebody's ears, being in their car, being in their dog walk or their gym routine or whatever it may be, or at their workbench as a watchmaker, because watchmakers aren't ever going to be allowed to watch YouTube videos. And the brand's appreciating that it's a different thing being a podcast than being written media, than being video media. Uh, and it's such an, on the one hand, it's a mature product, on the other hand, it's an immature product. But I think that's what slowly see people through. We see it in the people we speak to going, all right, okay, they now get it. You know, podcasting's, you've been doing it for a long time, but it's, it's probably become vaguely mature and acceptable as a, a medium in the last three years, maybe. You know, in the same way that some brand, you know, brands held off selling on the internet until COVID. COVID's probably got a lot to answer for. You know, every man and their dog, and some of them did include men and dogs, uh, we're producing watch podcasts. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it still happens. It's easy to get into, but it takes a lot of effort to stick it out because the rewards are not are simply not there. You're not going to get wealthy uh, making a podcast unless you stick at it for a very long time. Three to five years, regular content you might start to see a return on it. But most of them don't see a return and so don't stick to it. They go to video, they do watch collaborations, they sell stuff. Because actually, <laughs> that's where the money is, at least short term. But if you want to build a brand and a reputation, you need to decide where you want to be and just do your best to not be tempted to deviate. Or if you are going to deviate, let go of the thing you were doing <coughs> and do something else. So, Thanks yeah. for all that. I, I have to add some things to just sort of uh, uh, embellish some things you said because there's a lot of agreement here. When thinking about the same question about what needs to change in the podcast industry, actually where my mind went to was giving marketers a little bit more ability to understand the effectiveness of ads, right? Because we mm -hmm. know that they're obsessed with being able to measure performance. And right now, there are not a lot of tools out there that work across all the different types of downloads. And I think that that's one of the things people need to understand. Wherever you're listening to this is probably not the same place as the next person listening to this because there's a bunch of different ways of, of getting this. And each of those things has its own nuances, own statistics or lack of statistics. So a marketer trying to understand the full effect of an ad or some type of marketing inside of a podcast um, has to work on a lot of faith, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that you and I are both very sold 
on, as you said, the engagement, the ability to permeate into someone's mind of a talk-based program. And when Mm -hmm. I hear people go into video, it's not because this format doesn't work. It's because the internet at that time uh, has more value in video ads. Mm -hmm. So a YouTube, for example, wants to monetize things. This is this is the name of the game now, YouTube, Instagram, whatever it is now. Gone are the days of the beneficent social media platform that just wants to spread your message far and wide. <clears throat> Today, these platforms are like, oh, we got bills to pay. We need to make sure this content is working for us. So your <clears throat> content must fit in to their revenue model. It must be something that they can put ads around if you ever want a chance of them promoting it widely. <clears throat> that is the new paradigm, whether or not they're saying it to you. So now... The next step of a podcasting means that there are either new free open platforms that are divorced a bit from advertising or are great at adding advertising, or we go back to a more traditional model, we'll call it networks and stations, where there is a, a collective of podcasts and there's one dedicated sales team, which is selling advertising across them. And because there's a bunch of shows, they can mm. sort of have more power to sell. And these, of course, exist a little bit. But I think that there might be um, more value to them in the future because what they're yeah. able to do is also market the shows, try to get more listeners and things like that. And and this is still such a new area. In several years, it will um more of this will form. But because it's such a low barrier to entry, we are again seeding another one of those feeding frenzies where people are like, podcasting, I got to get in on that. And again, we know that most people don't really research enough to determine, can I make money like that person over there that looks like they're making money? Or are they even making money? And that's one of the most interesting things that I've seen in online media is that people assume that these businesses or these accounts or whatever are making money. This is a huge fallacy. The number of social media accounts or media properties out there that earn any type of profit, let alone like can support a staff, Mm. is tiny compared to all the people out there that are basically doing it as a a hobby they pay for. Even Mm. if it tries to look like they're running a business, they're sort of faking it till they make it. And we have... Too many people who don't seem to understand this it seem to think that someone – just because someone's had an account for a year or two means they must be raking in the dollars. I mean most YouTube accounts don't make any real type of money to think of given the costs of, of producing and putting these videos up and things like that. Um, this is – this would be – in a lot of instances, sorry to be controversial, with slave labor wages. I mean really. Mm. Uh, so this is – there's a lot of – misunderstandings out there about the economics of it. But as you said, there is going to be, for the foreseeable future, an awful lot of people that will get more out of listening to something because their eyes are occupied with something else than sitting there being forced to watch a video. And while you're driving, while you're walking, while you're working, you can oftentimes listen to something, whereas having to watch something is something you do in your leisure time. And Mm. while people had, I guess, more of that during the pandemic, um, people these days don't have a lot of uh, leisure time to stare at a screen some more. And that's why I firmly believe in uh, uh, the long longevity um, and the increasing relevancy of this medium. Yeah, I agree. I I think it's it's not not going away. There will be plenty of other people come in and give it a bash. It will be interesting to see as to whether anyone you can come in and really disrupt it. You know, we're always trying new things uh, within within the team, but you know, once you kind of find your lane, that's kind of where you stick to. You know, if something's been successful, it's very difficult to go right. And now we're going to change and pivot in this direction. So it'll be interesting to see if if a squad of people or an individual or a couple managed to come in and and bring something really new to the podcasting world within watches i think it'd be quite a challenge whereas because all you've got really is your voice i think it's much easier to have a shtick you know if you're on youtube you know you can be the loud guy or the guy in the bright shirts or the t-shirts or uh, you know with the cars or you know backgrounds and walks and fields whatever it happens to be but you know, to be good on radio is much more difficult 
than being good visually because you can let the visuals do some of the heavy lifting. In audio, you only got your voice and what's between your ears and that's pretty much it. And any chemistry you manage to create between between the people you have on. So it'll be interesting to see. I'd love someone to come in with a really novel idea and just go, yeah, that's 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 just the way to do this. You know, that, you know, I, 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 love, I love to have that moment of, I wish I'd thought of that. Because those <laughs> moments are are really good, you know. And, and watches as well. You look at something and you go, "I wish I'd thought of that." Uh, and I don't think we've seen. I think we're seeing a lot of yeah, we've seen that before, and not a lot of "I wish I'd thought of that" moments in podcasting, in YouTube, in watch media. There's not a lot of that about. But you know, I look forward. If anyone's out there and has got a I wish I thought about that, but really need someone to help me, then do reach out. <laughs> Podcasts at blogtowatch.com. Uh, we're happy to promote new talent. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I hope somebody does come along with just a brand new way of thinking about a thing. It'd be fun, be fun to see. That, that's right. Just a reminder that if you want to talk to us or give us ideas or whatever, you can email podcast at ablogtowatch.com. Uh, we're, we're out of time. That was a great place uh, to end. And I want to uh, encourage everyone to listen to the A Blog to Watch weekly podcast hosted by Richard. Yes. <laughs> uh, this has been the Superlative Podcast interview with Richard Atkinson. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. See you again on Tuesday for recording A Blog to Watch weekly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Come on.